We have things like public housing. We have all sorts of things that are designed not to give people just a handout, but to give people a fighting chance. A fighting chance? So many people vandalized their public housing projects that governments ended up destroying them. Again. And again. They build it, it wrecks neighborhoods, and then they blow it up. Public housing doesn't wreck neighborhoods. Unattended public housing wrecks neighborhoods. When we look at the best moments of public housing, like the Taylor Homes early in the you know, 1960s in Chicago, uh, they worked out just fine. Fine? Government programs do often start nicely. But within 15 years, the Taylor Homes were a crime-ridden, graffiti-covered wreck. The drugs are on them. The government's solution? Once again, demolish the entire project. And yet, right. the left yeah. wants we more handouts. I think that the basic affordances of democratic citizenship are housing, health care, and education. We have to make sure that... What happened to life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness? That's like secret code for housing, health care, and education. It, it seems to me... Well, but that's a big step beyond. You can't have life, liberty, and happiness if you, if you don't have access to a hospital. You can't have it if you don't have access to a basic education. Those but if you life. leave people alone to have life, liberty, and to pursue their own happiness. That's different from taking money from one group of people to give other people housing and health care. First of all, we're not giving people housing and health care. And people pay taxes. Even people who live in public housing pay taxes. What we're doing, again, is creating an investment. We're not teaching dependency? No, I think that you can, you can, you always run the risk of intergenerational laziness. But I don't think that the welfare state necessarily means that. But it does, says Star Parker. It's so much easier to take than to make. I think that that's one of the greatest tragedies of becoming a taker, is you don't think about that somebody else had to make this, and you don't think about You're what if I tried on my own. I was just entitled to it. Entitled to a nice apartment on a tree-lined street with a balcony. And I had a fireplace, I had a spa in the back. And I had Stories like hers you know, drove the push for welfare reform. Today we are taking an historic chance to make welfare what it was meant to be. A second chance, not a way of life. Some people predicted trauma we haven't known since the cholera epidemics. Families will fracture. A million children could be forced into poverty. There would be people starving in the streets. Nobody starved. The record numbers of people that were on there just left the welfare system and nobody died. Star Parker found jobs. I started a little magazine and it began to grow over time. She never returned to welfare. Most people went and got jobs and some went and um, went home, apologized to their mom, and moved in and started over, got back in the school. Other, uh, folks started thinking about their own life again. Nearly two million children rose out of poverty. Welfare caseloads fell by half. Yet that success hasn't convinced politicians that handouts hurt people. It's so essential to pass the unemployment insurance extension. Unemployment benefits used to last 26 weeks. But Congress has extended them to nearly two years. That does encourage dependency. It did encourage me to pass up open uh, job openings that I could have applied for. How many? Uh, probably half a dozen. Patrick Berry lost his job writing software manuals. He says his 99 weeks of unemployment benefits led him to turn jobs down because they paid less than unemployment. That would amount to a pay cut. And why would I want to do that? Fresno, California has 17% unemployment. Yet people who run employment agencies here tell us people turn down jobs all the time. We call them for a position and they say, no thanks, I'm on unemployment. A lot of people take advantage to try to work the system. If the state's going to give me money, why not take it? Unemployment agencies say many people just pretend to look for work. Enterprise personnel, this is Nancy, may I help you? They pretend because that's required to get your check. Yes, we do. They're, you know, completely not dressed for an interview in shorts, a t-shirt, and flip-flops saying, oh yeah, I want to get a job really bad, please hire me. And they'll come through the interview process and we know that they're not going to go to work. I would say maybe 25 to 35 percent of the people that we're talking to are just not trying. That's not what we hear from our president. I haven't met any American who would rather have an unemployment check than a meaningful job that lets you provide for your family. But incentives matter. In Denmark, the socialist government once offered laid-off workers five years of unemployment benefits. When did many Danes finally find work? Surprise, after exactly five years. So Denmark cut benefits to four years. Then Danes found jobs in four years. 
This year, Denmark cut the benefits in half. A survey found that one-third of the unemployed find work immediately when their unemployment benefits run out. When there were only a few weeks left, I actually did start looking at jobs that I had been passing up the chance to apply for. We should have a safety net to help people who cannot help themselves. But I don't think we ought to have a safety net that lulls people into lies of complacency and dependency on the federal government. Again, it is kind to want to help people who've fallen in hard times. But government handouts encourage people to rely on handouts instead of on themselves. Coming up, the alternative. What makes you happy? Money? Well then, what could be better than winning a lottery? Look at those big smiles. Oh my gosh. But here's Not the surprise for most. A few months later, they're not happier at all. On the contrary, the lottery winners are less happy. When people don't earn their own success, they're not as happy, they're not as healthy, and ultimately... Arthur Brooks wrote a book about happiness. Our society. What do you mean? They're not as happy? No, they're I not as happy. It would make you happy to get a check. <laughs> it would seem, but actually it's not true. Earned success is really the elixir of joy in an entrepreneurial society. People who accomplish things. Exactly, people who earn their success. People like Jesse Walter. I teach kids to cook. She runs Cupcake Kids, right, so a business that does cooking events for kids. <laughs> Here she's teaching them how to make zucchini muffins. What do you think? Doesn't it smell really good? Walter lost a job on Wall Street when the housing bubble burst. But she didn't mope and ask for a handout. She thought about what she could do next. I was like, I could do this. You know, I could teach kids to cook. Now we've built a kitchen. While helping herself, she helped others. Not just the kids. She created jobs. Yep. We have an events manager, a kitchen manager. How does this look? Awesome. I work more than I did, if that's believable. And despite that, she says she's happier. I love it, and it's, you know, every day's different. These are the happiest people, and those are the people who are most rewarded most of the time by the free enterprise system. A recent Gallup poll found business owners have a higher sense of well-being, even though they work longer hours and make less money. There's an enormous causal relationship between how much success that you think you've earned and how happy you are, and if that is followed by money, so much the better. I live in Janesville, Wisconsin. I can think of about 10 entrepreneurs off the top of my head who started with nothing, who have made great businesses, and they look at this as the American dream. One of those entrepreneurs is Ralph Tanuta. Hi. Hi, how are you? He started this deli with his father. He bought this little candy store. In 60 years, they grew it into a famous Wisconsin super deli. I love everything about it. I'm taking my daughter here. She's from California, so she can experience Tanuta's. Where you been? The owners have given lots of kids their first job. We must have hired, this in the, through the years, thousands of kids. This is what makers do. They create opportunities for themselves and others. Arrivederci. Salute. That you can start off and go and make it for yourself. That's what built the country. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's what's made us so exceptional. But will we be exceptional tomorrow? That's next. You union thugs are sucking the life out of America. This is how I get to work most mornings. I take the subway. Or sometimes I take the bus. Both the bus and the subways in my town are run by an organization called the MTA. It's like a government monopoly that's losing money hand over fist. Most of that money goes to pay bus drivers, subway conductors, train mechanics, and so forth, most of whom are union members, and most of them belong to Transit Workers Union Local 100, run by John Samuelson. We represent 34,000 uh, subway and bus workers. And their contract's much too rich, says the MTA. The MTA says we're $800 million in the hole. Cut us some slack. <laughs> There's nothing funny about it, says James public McDougall. Sector. Public sector unions are parasites that will bankrupt America. It is literally the parasite devouring the host. The host, he says, is private enterprise. And the parasite is unions and governments. It's 
crazy that, that the private sector is literally dying and the federal government is providing more and more and more pay and benefits to its own employees at the same time. McDougal's a businessman who built this payroll service company from scratch. His business was all about employee pay. And so over the years, he's been dismayed to watch government award their workers raises and special benefits like retirement at age 55. I mean, it correct. used to be the deal, you go work for the government because it's safe, you can't be fired, but you make less. Now they make, if you include the pension, double. More than double because they have fantastic benefits. People say you union thugs are sucking the life out of America. You know what I say to that? I say that the trade union movement is the greatest anti-poverty um, program that was ever developed. Jobs are the best anti-poverty program. There's more job growth when you guys are not involved. That's absolutely false. The trade union movement and civil service in this country has been the gateway into the middle class. That's, that's what this is about. Really? I don't know many in the middle class with benefits like these. Union transit workers reach top pay grade after just three years. They take lots of sick days with full pay and they can get to retire with a good pension at age 55. Why is that fair? Well, let me tell you, why isn't that fair? This is the, this because is the, most people can't. Most people work till 65 well, or let, longer. Let's, let's address that. We work in disgusting conditions. We work around human fecal matter, dead rats. We breathe in steel dust all day long. We're out there keeping the system running. When folks like you are, are sitting in a studio interviewing guys like me, is that fair? And to make it fair, you get to retire at 55. Absolutely. Transit workers like cops and firemen say they deserve higher pay because their jobs are dangerous. But America's most dangerous jobs are logging and most dangerous of all, fishing. Much more dangerous than police or transit work. Loggers don't retire at 55. People who fish for a living, I don't know anything about jobs. loggers. But I look at the most deadly jobs Mm -hmm. Fishing is at the top of the list. Logging, farming, garbage men, roofers, transit workers are way down. This is the richest country in the world to expect that. we can't that, afford you anymore. Uh, that, that is, that's an absurd statement. Bill Schoolman's bus company competes with the MTA. Their pay is so much higher than, than what a private business can afford to pay. It is a corrupt practice to see the way that they burn taxpayer dollars. Schoolman trains bus drivers, but often loses them to the MTA. They got much better benefits. He starts with a 30-day vacation. Very hard to compete. Not to mention all the sick days. A fourth of your workers took more than 15 sick days. In the private sector, they wouldn't last long doing that. I don't believe that's true. It's not true that a quarter of the people take 15 sick days? About 25% of our workforce are women. Women have babies. But in the private sector, there are women getting pregnant. Are you saying that women who are pregnant? How, how long is a, I mean, let's, let's talk about I'm just wondering why there are so many sick days. I'm telling you why there's so many sick days. There's a significant amount of, of New York City transit workers are women now, whereas it, it, it never was like that. And there are a lot of women around here too. Mm -hmm. And when they get pregnant, how much time do they take off for work? I don't know. So? I'll find I, out. You're, you're pointing your finger at me and, uh, and, and, and at my union, and, and you really don't even have an answer for it. So I got an answer. New mothers at both the MTA and Fox get maternity leave. And lots of women around here have gotten pregnant. But not a single Fox employee took 15 sick days. The average was three sick days. And women take no more than men. 83 transit workers claimed a passenger spat on me. 51 of them took an average 64 days off. Have you ever been spit on? Yeah, actually. You, you have. I don't like it, but I, I, I wouldn't get 64 days off. We've had folks that have been spat upon that have gotten hepatitis. They've been spit in the eye and gotten eye infections and have taken significant amount of times off for that. 